All right, this is John Reed. I've got Julian Devot in his SAP Mentor garb. What's up? <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm rocking it, but but I'm disappointed. It's on the audio now, so I know. <laughs> I'm gonna have to get a picture of you so people can see what I'm talking about here. <laughs> we are at the tail end of SAP Control Line 2015, and there's some very interesting issues going on at this show around predictive and around the future of analytics that are not totally SAP related. So we're gonna start with those. And then we're going to dig in a little further to some SAP topics. But I think what's interesting for folks to understand is that controlling an SAP used to be a little more, it was important, but it didn't change a whole lot year to year. And now with all the emphasis, not only on SAPs on S4 HANA, but with all the emphasis on predictive and big data and the mm -hmm. internet of things, yeah. this is really becoming a big topic. Yes. And, um, I, I think that what we've seen changing is really for people to start moving away from um, just the, just data collection and manipulation and trying to move into really yeah. the data analytics, right? right. <clears throat> so with better tools, they were able now to look, not just look in the past and, and in the rearview mirror, but try to look at today and hopefully in the future. So I think that's it's, it's very interesting to see this shift over the last four years of the conference going from very transactional operational issues to now, well, let's talk about this vision, this simple finance right. and, and those new uh, analytical tools. So yeah, it's a very interesting um, start and discussion there. So what is your take on predictive in general? Because it's one of the hugely hyped phrases <laughs> in, the, in the IT world. Do you think it's possible for people to get a business result out of that? And if so, how would they go about that? Yes, it's... I mean, it's a very interesting question. Uh, and during the panel, there were some um, some questions and comments about it. I believe, um, uh, I mean, you mentioned hyped. There was this article from the New York Times about uh, those pro professions that might be replaced by robots. And if you type your profession, you, you'll see your likelihood. Right. So, so I'm sorry to break the news, but accountants are going to be replaced by robots by 2017 or 2020 or something like that. Really, it's coming right up. So, yeah, yeah, it's it's tomorrow, <laughs> right? So better better get ready there. But uh, joking aside, uh, there there is value. Let me give you an example of uh, imagine you're an international company and um, you have multiple SKUs and you're selling through various distribution channels. So planning. Is, is a nightmare. Right? It takes months and you have to go into those details if you really want to do it correctly. And because you can't, because of that volume, uh, what happens is that now you go to aggregate it, right? So you, you, you just plan by region or you plan by product group or, right. or customer group. That's good enough. What if, uh, you could use a tool like predictive analytics and analyze all your sales data from, from the years before and then propose a plan for next year, and then you only have to tweak it. So, so mm. most of the groundwork has already been done, and then you only have to, well, this is the new product, or this is because we're going to push in that particular country, uh, we're going to move there. So just, you know, what if, what if the tool can do most of the groundwork for you, um, and then you only have now to add value as opposed mm -hmm. to crunch numbers, and then the number you got is, is just what you get. And do you think that, when you talk about I had a really interesting conversation with someone from the consumer packaged goods industry here over lunch the other day, a large presence. I can't really say their particular industry, but let's just say you consume it regularly. <laughs> uh, and they, they were talking about how they, they, they have a, a geo global supply and demand mm -hmm. issues that like, isn't quite like your example because they need to be making decisions pretty quickly. Right. Things change course for them quickly. And they use some interesting examples. For example, they need to know a lot about Chinese markets mm -hmm. and how Chinese markets are fluctuating. It's right. a big, big area for them. And they also said that weather patterns are hugely significant for what they're trying to do. And so are you seeing also that that's part of what may factor in here? We're talking about predictive. Yeah, and I think predictive goes goes beyond just just the data you got. You have to go into big data, even though, I mean, the, right. the, the term is a little uh, cheesy sometimes, but, um, and Kasten Hilker from SAP Solution Management was also saying, well, you know, there, there are some cultural uh, differences between different customers. So if you can include those data, uh, then that would help. Um, we had examples, we have a presence here from, from Brazil, uh, so that was also very interesting to see, well, you know, currency is fluctuating and, and if we could help a little bit, 
uh, as of today and tomorrow. And so not just like way next year, but making decisions today is very important. And I think the tools are also doing that to help you uh, making decisions. Uh, examples we saw from SAP demonstrations were really having uh, smart systems, I would say, where when you have a problem and not just identifying the problem is the key, but what decisions can you make? And they were mm -hmm. also like ranking decisions for like shipment is breaking, what are you going to do? So um, I, I think um, we should be able to use predictive in analytics, but also in, in operations. And that's really the next step where it makes a lot of sense. We can get value there. Right. And that seems to be the way when you talked about smart system that seems to be the way of coping with this deluge of data because to be honest with you a lot of the customers here that i talked with they seemed like they were still struggling with data overload and quality of data and stuff like that and when you talk to them about bringing in external sources of data they're like oh shit <laughs> yeah. it's like i've got enough to deal with already but if they had solutions that help them to surface maybe the problem areas or the exceptions or the things that require human intervention, mm -hmm. maybe they'd be more interested. Yes, and I think that the key word in what you said is, is exception. Um, let, let the robot handle the, the common, right? It's like you receive an invoice and it's exactly the same amount as you expected. Well, why do you need somebody to check it? Right. And then now focus on the exceptions. Why is it that, I think somebody was saying, well, you know, electricity consumption doubled. So what happened there? Mm -hmm. so, so to manage by exception and then use those external data to then predict or, or do something about it. The other interesting thing, you referred to the panel, which was a panel that I moderated that you were on, on uh, modernizing mm -hmm. uh, SAP, which took on a bigger dimension. It was really looking at just sort of how companies can be competitive and what stands in the way. and. What I was really struck by was about halfway through the panel, one of the people in the audience really asked a question about really more the human side of this. You know, like basically he was talking about, he started talking about SAP training, but he went much deeper. He was talking about young people entering the workforce without mm -hmm. really the right skills and, and, and just the struggle to figure out how it is you become, uh, I guess, successful in an enterprise context in such a crazy market where there's so much happening. It's not just configuration anymore it's analytics mm -hmm. it's and then and then back to change management a little bit in the discussion as well in terms of just managing change being a real big factor and um uh one our keynote speaker gary Kokins, yes <laughs> he also spoke about change management being a real impeditive to a lot of like predictive scenarios and so what are your thoughts on on the human side of this no that's that's very interesting and we've seen that that trend as a consulting company where you know, the problem is not the system. I mean, we can make a change in a week and then, I mean, the solution is there. But the, the, the problem is that adoption of the solution uh, has like a repull effect and it takes a month or two or more uh, right. to, to get there. An example of, of one of the customers this week was, well, we know we were, we were trying to do this, this change on this plant and, and it was supported by half of the plant and, and it was supposed to be a nine months project and six months in the other half of the plant figured it out and started fighting that battle. So of course it, it went from well, nine months to a year and more. And then by that time, there was a new release and now there's a third group that now fighting the first two ones to get the new release as opposed to the old release on Nord. So, so it's, <laughs> Uh, so what we did to solve that, we uh, we hired a, a great expert actually uh, with like 20, 20 years experience in Lean Six Sigma and Black Belt and, and those things um, to to support our projects because change management is it's much more critical. I think the first key is just just getting consensus. If, if we could just get that, <laughs> that would be a, a very good start. Right. Um, um, so, so that's, that's the first part of it. And I think the second one you were referring to from, from, from that question from the gentleman during the panel was, was training right. and, and training is changing. Um, it used to be very classroom driven and, uh, it was really, um, solution driven. You're going to learn this transaction yeah. and, and it's not about the transaction anymore. It's, it's about the process. And how mm -hmm. all the pieces of the puzzle have, have to be working together. So there's a, a growing trend um, of online trainings first. Uh, and they are going to be much more, much smaller and much more focused. And then there will be a lot more functional side as well. Right. Uh, completely tool agnostic. I think this is going to be 
a very interesting trend. So. When you say change management is becoming much more important, that's interesting to me because I would argue that change management has always been sort of overlooked and 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 crucial to a product success. Why do you think it's becoming more important now? Well, I and I think that companies maybe they failed enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, why would you in in the past when you would put a line on a on a proposal that says change management, it was kind of fuzzy. Why would why would you do that? It's right. just so let's get rid of that or make it as cheap as possible. And now and now they failed enough that uh, it becomes critical. And if you don't propose it, they will look at you and say, why, why, why do you not have it? So okay. I, I believe it's just a, just a factor of experience and, and failure, right? So it's the memory of falling <laughs> off the bike and scraping your knee a bunch of times. Exactly. So maybe you need a helmet. <laughs> <laughs> Change management is your enterprise helmet. No, it, it, <laughs> does, it does make sense. I'm glad to hear it because for years there's been data that shows how important training is to product success, and yet training budgets haven't really expanded. But if there's progress on change management front, that's at least one encouraging sign. Yeah, and maybe there's a there's there's one I'm just thinking about it right now. It's we also changed a lot from the waterfall pure strategy, right, uh, into more of an agile process. Yeah. yeah. So, and it, I'm thinking especially about the reporting side of it, where you know you re, you 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 gather your requirements, and then three months later you you get a report that has nothing to do with what you really wanted to do as opposed to either a self-service BI or an agile, and then you go into prototyping and you get feedback. So by the end of the project, first the project is supposed to be faster, but imagine it's a three-month project. You don't just spend two weeks on it at the very end right. of it. You've been touching it for three months and preparing and give it feedback. So maybe that's also another mm -hmm. benefit of moving to agile. Yeah, I'm struck by that because when you think about when you think about Agile, like I think Agile can be pretty effective in a lot of contexts, but it does actually ask more of the user in some ways. Absolutely, and that's the goal. They have to be in there. Exactly. Yeah. And so that there's a behavior change there, and yeah. maybe change management is sort of part of that. Is like, look, you know, you're going to be a lot more involved, which is the good news. With you know, but the bad news is you're going to be a lot more involved. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know? well, if you want something you like, you need to you need to be more involved. Yeah. The other interesting thing that came up around this is we had our, what I call our unconference day today, where we kind of throw things up on a whiteboard to see what people want to talk about. And again, change management and, and user training really came up strongly. Yeah. And, and we don't see that as much in past years. And so maybe that validates your point. And in the discussion that we had about it, which you missed because you were doing your rock star presentation <laughs> in the other room, um, we, the same thing came up, which was, Basically, how do I get my users to embrace the system that we work so hard to to build that we think is really going to serve the company and, mm -hmm. and serve their needs? So we spent a long time talking about that, and I guess I guess it's encouraging because maybe folks are becoming much more aware that just because you configured something properly doesn't make a damn bit of difference if no one's using it. Absolutely. So so so. Um, Kevin Riley, who is uh, now the uh, advocate at the ASUC, was talking about it over lunch. Yeah, uh, yeah. Exactly, and he was uh, he was on the job, and and the CIO comes in. He was CFO. CIO comes in and says, oh, "How are you going to solve that problem?" And and he answered, "Well, of course, he was just two weeks on the job, so maybe that was a, a, something you can say." And he said, "Well, I'm not going to do it." We are going to do it, and I think that's a complete culture shift now. Now it's not an IT solution. Mm -hmm. It's a business solution, and you need to shift the ownership uh, between just the users. Uh, user is not an, a user. It has to be a, an owner of the solution. Maybe that's kind of the shift. That makes sense, and I think that's a good stopping point for the first shorter podcast we're doing. So thanks for joining for that. Pleasure.